Today I'm going to go through uh, the design of the encoder for the uh, motor on the Charlie. So this uh, plate is like a full steel plate and I didn't want to actually drill into it um, at this time. So I've created um, a PLA plastic uh, assembly that takes some um, e-waste uh, optical sensors and puts them into a quadrature uh, encoder configuration so that uh, you get twice the pulses per uh, edge on the encoder wheel. So that gives you twice the resolution essentially for um, the same number of pulses or, or same number of slots on your wheel. Um, so what the intent of this is is to give us a really um, fine resolution on the speed of the rear wheel and with this we can use that to create um, sort of a, a window at which you know when there's a difference between the front wheel speed and the rear wheel then we can change the uh, throttle to decrease the torque and basically allow this thing hopefully to go back down um, and you know this this is because the scooter itself has a really weird center of gravity. Now, the center of gravity, um, back when this had lead acid uh, batteries, probably wasn't horrible, but it still was pretty uh, um, poppy, you could say, <clears throat> because literally the seat is sitting right on the axis of the rear wheel, which means that you know, you're going to be very easy to pop this up um, whenever you give it the motor some torque. So again, you know, the, the hope is that um, the speed feedback from the rear can be used to, you know, sort of set a guard band around what the speed feedback is coming from the front wheel. The problem with the front wheel, take a look at it here. Is that we only have one pickup per rotation versus the optical encoder wheel that has like you know hundreds when you take take into account the uh, doubling so it, it's not a really good resolution however um, I'm going to still see if we can get it to to be used to check against uh, you know speed uh, variances between front and back so now I'll just go into how the construction is done. So here's the SOLIDWORKS model for the encoder, its housing, and uh, the PCB board, and etc. So we can see that um, the two optical sensors that I, I used are located here. And that's actually set up to be in the sort of the 90 degree um, phase relationship. And this is our motor. Uh, steel plate that I didn't want to drill into and then I have my housing which kind of clamshells it together and and clamps it the uh, the encoder uh, control board and the sensors it clamshells it around the motor mounting plate and physically locates the encoder disc which is this guy um, so that it actually sits sits in the proper location so we can see on the, the end view here. So that's that's not really that complicated to uh, to do that. Um, if I find later on that this becomes a problem with the uh, heat from the motor, um, causing any um, distortion of the the clamshell uh, assembly then I will probably redo this and um, likely end up having to drill into the plate to put studs in and actually a proper mount of the encoders with a, a higher temperature mounting method. But, you know, this is all about uh, seeing what works and doesn't work. And, uh, you know, if it does start to uh, deform and break, then you know, it just means an opportunity to try something new. 
So now I'm going to go in and explain a little bit about what is the actual function uh, of a quadrant coder or how, how does it actually work. And um, you know that will be more descriptive than looking at the model I'm showing here. Okay, let's talk about the theory of the optical uh, quadrant encoder. So a quadrant encoder is made up of two optical sensors that are located spatially 90 degrees out of phase. So that can be positive 90 degrees or negative, negative degrees or 90 degrees. Um, doesn't really matter, but they have to be at least 90 degrees uh, absolute out of phase from each other. Um, the slots on your wheel should be equally spaced around um, and this just gives you a better well-formed pulse train if you do that um, and you know you'll notice that uh, you know in my diagram here that I've actually have these set up spatially 90 degrees so if we consider the slot center of the slot to center of the slot as being 360 degrees then you can look at the center of the blank to center of slot as being 180 degrees and then center of slot to edge 90 and if we keep going across this way then you know this would be 270 degrees and then to the center is 360. So I have sensor B actually setting on set on the 270 degree um, displacement and again that doesn't matter it's the key thing is that you're looking at one edge only occurring at any one time and you know being able to use that to uh, clock in um, the opposite phase so that you can determine the direction and I'll show you what I mean by that so with with uh, quadrant coder the key or the cool thing about it is that uh, you can actually determine which way the wheel is rotating based on um, the phasing. And you do that by using uh, a D-latch. And on a D-latch, if you're using one sensor to clock it and using the other sensor as its input, it will clock in either a 1 or a 0 depending on which direction it's going. And that's because of the spatial relationship and how you know, you're only seeing one edge at a time so if you look at my graph on the corner here, um, this is already preset with the direction being set at one. And you know we've got our uh, sensor B sitting on the edge. So it's going to go from um, an on to an off state, which is being indicated by the arrow going down and showing the state as being low. A is going to remain at high because it's in the middle of the, uh, the slot and we'll still be in the middle or, or towards the slot as we move on. Um, so if we go into the next state, A is just approaching the edge and doing a falling edge. B is now in the middle of the blank. And this is a, this is being, um, the D latch is being clocked as a, a positive edge, rising edge. So uh, the falling edge wouldn't have done anything. So we continue on. As you see, there's only one edge occurring now we're looking at B being on the edge of the slot, in which case this generates a rising edge. So a rising edge, it's going to clock what it sees on the D. And the D line for A is going to be 0. And this relationship will always be the same as this rotates clockwise on this diagram. Now it, it really depends which phase is being used to clock uh, the D latch. So you know if you grab any quad encoder off the... Off the um, shelf that's not necessarily the relationship it just depends which one is being used to clock so you can actually force it to be whatever you want by just swapping those two lines um, so now if we just continue on we'll see that on the next rising edge we're still with you know optical encoder a sensor um, it's still low and so this will continue on now, if we look at switching the direction, okay, so now we see that with the direction being changed, B is actually going to be clocking high at that instance. 
and A is going to be in the middle of the slot. So as B is clocking high and A is high, it will clock in a 1. So our direction has now switched from being um, a 0 to being a 1. So And it will remain that way for every rising edge of B, it will always be a 1. So if we just let this run along here, this is just going forward and backwards and you can see that the direction is being indicated for which direction it's going. So the pulse train, as I mentioned before, um, you are seeing two distinct sets of uh, pulse trains coming off of the two sensors. And you can see that they're out of phase by 90 degrees. And combining it through the XOR generates twice the frequency. So that's the great thing about the quad encoders is that uh, you can get much higher resolution from a lower set of uh, encoder pulses. And that's great because eventually you reach a limit, manufacturing limit and technology limit where you can't uh, realistically, you know, cost effectively um, increase your resolution. So now we'll just go on to uh, looking at the actual, you know, operation of the encoder on the on the Charlie. Now I haven't actually have any um, uh, controller that's going to accept its input yet. That's coming as I work on the bits and pieces, but uh, you know I will be showing that in the future. <laughs> Okay, now I've got the control board and the plastic housing just kind of clamped onto the motor um, with some elastic bands. You can just see the encoder disc in there. So with the oscilloscope, you can see the, the lower channel, um, that is like channel 2 is the direction. And the upper channel, which is channel 1, 
that is the uh, encoder pulse output. So if I just turn that wheel backwards, you can see that my direction is low and my pulse train is coming out normally. So if I reverse my direction, so I'm going forward, my pulse train is now high, or sorry, the uh, direction is high, and I have my pulse train. So this is showing my direction of the wheel. If my wheel's going backwards, that's a problem. So let's just put some uh, power to the motor so you can see what the uh, pulse train looks like at, at uh, speed. Very noisy. So that is the quad encoder. So the next step is either the relay board, which I got my relay, but I haven't actually got uh, got anything uh, set up for actually mounting it and controlling it. Um, the motor controller still has to be done. Uh, I have a donor case that I'm looking at. Probably do a video on that sometime uh, in the next little while. I have to tear it apart anyway, so I want to see if if uh, it's recoverable for what I want to use it for. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at, and stay tuned for more.